Hello and welcome to Politics Europe. Theresa May's timetable for Brexit talks looks to be intact after MPs in Westminster overwhelmingly vote to trigger Article 50. With the start of Brexit talks just weeks away, who will the UK government be negotiating with? We report from Brussels on the EU's Brexit negotiators. The EU's Trade Commissioner warns Donald Trump against protectionist measures and promises to push for fair trade. We take a look at how the EU is responding to President Trump. Do you think we should have new legislation for robots? Why not? And should we be worried about the rise of the robots? Why members of the European Parliament are demanding new regulations to protect humans from artificial intelligence. So all that to come and more in the next half hour. First, though, here's our guide to the latest from Europe in just 60 seconds. MPs overwhelmingly agreed to let the government begin the UK's departure from the EU as they voted for the Brexit bill. The ayes to the right, 494. The noes to the left, 122. Romania's Prime Minister insisted he won't resign, despite mass protests calling for him and his cabinet to step down over a now abandoned corruption measure, with many saying they've lost trust in their leaders. Following the surge in fighting in eastern Ukraine between government forces and Russian-backed separatists, EU foreign ministers condemned the attacks on civilians. 23 of the 28 member states are breaching air quality standards, according to the European Commission. It recommends phasing out environmentally damaging subsidies, such as tax breaks for privately used company cars. And the idea to provide free interrail travel passes to all EU citizens on their 18th birthday hit the buffers. The European Commission will instead offer a cheaper plan, awarding a general travel budget to schools. And with us for the next 30 minutes, I'm joined now by the UKIP MEP, Jared Batten, and Labour's Annalise Dawes. Welcome to you both. Annalise Dawes, what happens if the European Parliament votes against this deal in a couple of years' time? I think that's a very good question, and actually there is a possibility of that. It's yeah, just sure. before European elections, so not mm -hmm. always a great time to have rational, dispassionate debate on issues. Okay, let's agree um, it's a good question. Do we have any idea what the answer is? Um, well, I just hope that we can get away from the kind of really conflictual, you know, argumentative approach that we've had so on you the don't UK know. side. And I, well, I, I mean, I, do I don't know. know. It's, if it's rejected, if there's no deal, which of course our British leader recently said she'd prefer to a bad deal, mm -hmm. I. I probably wouldn't, because if there's no deal, that means going out, exiting, just World Trade Organization rules, mm -hmm. um, you know, no clear future relationship. It wouldn't be good for it. Europe either, though, would it? No, it'd be very bad on all sides, I think, um, yeah. What do you think would happen? Well, that's a very interesting point, because perhaps the Council will do what it does when um, the European Parliament votes for a directive it doesn't want because it's been amended in such a way it doesn't want. It then ignores that and does it anyway because it has the power to reject. Whether it has the power to reject the vote of the Parliament on this is another matter. I'm not sure. But this that is would be pretty well nigh impossible. If the European yeah. Parliament took a vote against something as basic as the mm. Brexit deal. It could hardly well, the, ignore it. What would happen would uh, would happen is what Mrs May said is going to happen. Then we would just exit on World Trade Organization We'd terms just sort of just leave, crash out on WTO rules. Precisely why going down the Article 50 route is wrong anyway. Well, we're that boat's left the harbour, though, hasn't it? Uh, no, because uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have two years of negotiations with people who don't want to negotiate with us, who've told us that we can't have what we want, and at the end, have to have a deal which they can reject anyway. What we should have done, what the government could still do if it wanted to, and I am the Brexit spokesman for UKIP, by the way, and I'm writing our exit plan, step one should be to repeal the 1972 European Communities Act, which would, under our law, mean that we're no longer members. All EU legislation would remain in place because it's all been uh, incorporated as acts of parliament. Um, in fact, Bill Cash has done a very good draft bill yeah, on Yeah, yeah, like, we haven't got um, time for your thesis on the, uh, Well, that's on how this. to leave. But it's, th th that's, that route, leave. that's gone. That's not the government strategy. No, exactly. And it's also not how these issues are set out in the treaties. I mean, we've got that legal framework. We've got to somehow make it work. I think we've got to be grown-ups about this. We need to just start 
um, actually having a, a decent conversation, stop shouting at each other, stop threatening the rest of the EU, saying that we're going to slap tariffs on their cars or we're going to turn our country into a tax haven. We need but to have an adult conversation. The Europeans with have been quite uh, vocal as well, though I've noticed a change in tone, a more constructive tone in the past couple of weeks even. Well, I think so. And, you know, ultimately, it's no good, you know, as you said, it's no good for the rest of the EU if we don't have a deal that's going to work for everybody at the end of this. We've got to somehow take some of the, the steam and the, you know, highfalutin politics out of this and actually talk about it rationally, you know. Well, good luck with that. Well. <laughs> anyway, when the uh, Brexit talks get underway, they'll be led for the UK by David Davis, the Secretary of State, for exiting the EU. We know that. But what about the people he'll be facing across the negotiating table. Adam Fleming reports now from Brussels on the EU figures who will be going head-to-head -head with the UK government. Who knows who this is? Look familiar? Indeed, Mr Barnier. Mr Barnier, Very yes. Very important man. Is, French. Yeah. Michel Barnier. Mr Barnier, yes. Yeah, yeah. Do you know much about him? Yeah, he's going to negotiate the Brexit deal with the UK. Do you, do you know him? Yes, because I'm French. Oh, right, OK. Is he a big deal in France? Yeah, well, okay. big deal-ish. He's a big deal. He's in Grand Fromage. Mr Barnier is a former French foreign minister, a former European commissioner, and he was mastermind of the 1992 Winter Olympics. His catchphrase is keep calm and negotiate. Let's get a more three-dimensional picture from MEPs who know him. Um, I think he's a bit taller in real life, isn't he? Ah, actually, yeah, far yeah. taller, yeah. What's Mr Barnier like? Do you know him? Yeah, he's a very, very competent person, uh, true European. He is very expert also in uh, one of the most sensitive areas, like the financial service area. He's not someone with uh, uh, anti-British feeling, not at all. When he was commissioner, he always uh, uh, looked for balanced solution uh, in the area of financial services. But of course, as a, a chief EU negotiator, he will try, first of all, to protect the interest of the Union and also to strike a, a good agreement. I could say that he's a French with a British style. What does that mean? That means that he's very concise, very precise, he, uh, when someone gives him an argument or an idea, uh, if it is something reasonable, he will say, OK, it was not my first idea, but I accept. Uh, but if he thinks that is a red line, he will be always firm and resilient till the end. Parliament has its own negotiator, Guy Verhofstadt, leader of the Liberal Group, although his precise role isn't quite clear. Is he going to be in the room, actually? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And he is a very good negotiator, and everybody recognises that. He has years of experience. Prime Minister of Belgium, you gain a lot of experience uh, if you've done that and done it successfully. So, um, you know, we represent half a billion people. It is absolutely vital that any negotiation takes into account the needs and the aspirations of the people of the European Union. That's what it's all about. Then there's the man from the council, Didier Sayus, a Belgian lawyer, hardly a household name. Let's find out more from an old colleague. What he has is a lot of expertise. He's excellent at coming up with compromises when you have positions which are seemingly ir irreconcilable. He often finds a way of reconciling them. Um, he will have the knowledge. Um, he will know the positions of the member states. So we'll often be able to say to Barnier, yeah, you can agree this or that. It would be a bit risky. It might not get endorsed by the, member, the other member states, the 27, or that, absolutely no, no chance. But wait, the cast of characters gets even bigger. The Trade Commissioner, Cecilia Malmstrom, will be a big player if the UK and the EU also try to do a free trade deal at the same time. And never far from any decision is Martin Selmayr, Chief of Staff to the Commission President, Jean-Claude Juncker. Give me one name. Who's going to be the most influential person in the negotiations? I suppose uh, it's Mrs May. It's the elected representatives on both sides. I've got Mr Barnier. And so far, with his Gallic flair, towering presence and ability to captivate the British press, it does seem that the Commission's Monsieur Barnier will be the one who dominates the headlines.
So, Jared Batten, what do we know of Michel Barnier? Well, he's already said that, uh, for example, one of the key things in this, um, in this whole debate, which is um, freedom of movement, uh, is not up for discussion. He said it can't be changed. It, Britain has to accept it, and that's the one thing that the British people but are not going to but, accept. But it doesn't, now that Mrs May has said we're leaving the single market, the free movement's not a matter for debate. Well, no. he's, he's supposed to be negotiating our position. And I, I'd like no, to, he's I, supposed to be oh, negotiating sorry, their position, position, but this, in order to arrive at this mythical deal at the end of this long protracted process, he said that freedom of movement's not up for negotiation. Mr Verhofstadt but, said it's not up for negotiation. But it isn't a matter now. I mean, I, I'm not quite sure that... Freedom of movement uh, was one of the four freedoms that comes with being a member of the single market. If we are now saying, rightly or wrongly, we are now saying we will not be a member of the single market because freedom of movement's not an issue. Yes, but the the issue about tariff-free trade is, and there is a solution to that. But problem. you weren't saying that; you were talking about freedom of movement. But they're talking about that in order to talk, sort out the trade issues, which is the big issue, probably the second no, biggest issue. No, a free issue trade in the deal you can do. We do free trade deals. Uh, the European Union. The other countries, bilateral deals, they don't involve freedom of movement issues, as I would suggest. The EU Canada deal, which is the latest one, has no free freedom of movement implications. Then is that right? No, indeed. I mean, sometimes, of course, when Britain's tried to secure trade deals with countries like India, we have come a cropper on that issue. So, because the that's a visa issue. To, it, well, it, exactly. That's a visa but issue. But I, I would just come back on one thing that was said when you said, "Oh, the British people have decided that they don't want to have freedom of movement." Actually, most opinion polls show that. That even a majority of Leave voters said if there was a top up between having access to trade across the EU and having some freedom of movement, they would prioritise that access to trade. But clearly, uh, Theresa May has decided she wants to take us in a particular but direction. There will be some freedom of movement that. and there will be some access to the single market. That, these are the issues that have to be negotiated. Yeah. Uh, do we know anything yet? There were so many names there in Adam's film, all with their own constituencies. I don't mean that in a political sense, but their own interests in Brussels. Do we have any idea what the common line is going to be yet? Well, I think ultimately the EU 27, whether we're talking about them represented in the EU institutions or in member states, they're wanting to ensure the best outcome for all of them. And that is one that has a good deal for Britain as well. But that will not happen if we keep having a kind of zero sum politics, if we keep having sure. this trade off saying, you know, oh, well, if we have a deal that works for the rest of the EU, it's not possibly going to work for Britain and vice versa. Who's that saying that? Well, you've got, unfortunately, some political voices. Yeah, we've had those Give me one. Well, we've had the threats from Theresa May, for example, saying, oh, well, if we don't get that deal, then we're just yeah. going to turn ourselves into a you know, bargain well, basement tax haven. Well, no, the bargain That's... basement's your party's well, phrase. She's never okay. used well, she's that at all. What she said reduce... is that if we did come out on WTO rules, we would need, need to also consider our economic model that that doesn't. That there are plenty of choices between being what we are now and Singapore, well, Philip, which Philip isn't that Hammond, much of a bargain. Yeah, well, Philip Hammond has, has pushed the same line. They know exactly what they're saying. They're grown-ups. They know the kind of messages that they're sending, and I think they're deeply damaging ones when we should be building bridges rather than blowing them up, which we, is what they seem well, to be doing that, now. Well, except that if you hear what's come out of Europe recently, I was uh, listening to one of the Baltic state uh, ministers this morning on another channel. He was much more conciliatory. Poland has been beginning to say the same. Even Michel Barnier has said he understands the importance of the London capital markets to the whole of the EU. But what I wanted to ask you is this. We have a rough idea, I put it no higher than that, because of the white paper in Mrs May's Lancaster House speech of the British government's negotiating position. Rough idea. Don't we need... Doesn't the European Union now need to give its equivalent of its rough idea. Yes, uh, that's a very good point. And of course, as I said, we're going to have these very long two years of protracted negotiations mm. to end up in a position where we really should know where we want to be now, which is that we have freedom to make our own laws. We want to continue tari uh, trading on a tariff-free basis if mm. possible. We can make that offer to them very easily. The people who, although the Parliament has a vote on this, at the end, and these are the, the European Parliament could scupper the whole thing by voting against it, depending what it looks like. It's actually the, the Council that makes the decision to accept it or not by... Yeah. Yes, the Council of Ministers does that. And I feel that they are going to come under... Because they are the heads of government in their own countries. They're going to come under tremendous pressure from their own industries and businesses to actually reach a sensible agreement rather than the ideologues in the European Parliament. One of the things that could scupper the negotiations it would be if the EU insists 
on agreeing some kind of Brexit bill up front, uh, whether it's 40 or 60 billion or whatever, because I would suggest to you no British government can agree to that. Well, I mean, in an ideal world, would we be here at all? I mean, I can I can understand their thinking in talking about that. Actually, more recently, they've been saying they want to agree a, a methodology for deciding what the commitment would be rather than a figure. But, of course, people extrapolate figures out of that immediately. So there's what, not would it be, what would we be paying there. for? Um, well, um, just take one example, right? You can imagine, say, a, a Lithuanian civil servant, right, who joins the commission mm -hmm. when she's 25, OK? Now, when she joins, the British state had a liability for part of her mm -hmm. pension, OK? When she retires in 40, 50 years, whatever. Now, that's still going to be there in the future, you know, in the same way that it, the British state has got a liability for, for my pension when I've paid national insurance. Sure, so, but you're not so, leaving the British state. No, indeed. I mean, you are aware that issues. Brussels pensions, the pensions of Brussels bureaucrats, are between two and three times average earnings in Britain. You yeah, think the absolutely. British people are going to stand for that? Well, that they are th paying for pensions that are up to three times their average wage? No, I, I, I agree with you. There's going to be difficult discussions about that. What I worry about, though, is if this just gets turned into something about bashing quite a small number of people, essentially, and we're talking about small mm. amounts of money in comparison to the overall amount we could well, lose in trade deals, in, in comparison to the amount we could lose in trade deals. I'm not saying it's, it's peanuts, a lot of money, but in comparison to what we, what we could lose, you know, we need to look at these issues with an adult head on our shoulders. What, um, OK, what would you say to the demand, if that is what it is, for a, a, a divorce bill? Well, um, what the EU, EU is going to do what, F, what everybody else in the world has to do is, is when their income drops, they have to um, also reduce their outgoings. There will be people who've got uh, pension liabilities or, or whatever, and that, but I think that will be fairly minimal and, and the governments can get between, uh, agree between them how to, uh, how to deal with that, where obligations to particular people who've been working for a lifetime or whatever. Okay. But the idea of giving, uh, Mr Verhofstadt has proposed, that we give actually billions of pounds in order to pay for our membership up until 2020, the end of the current... Uh, a budget period. It's pure, it's pure fantasy. It's not, very briefly. It's not going to happen say, but, but, and it shouldn't happen. But there are a lot of things that you and the Leave campaign promised we'd keep getting, like the research funds, like you know, various other streams of funding that we, we were told we'd still get. Now, the money for that, potentially, has got to come from somewhere. It's our taxpayers' money, money anyway, and the research funds is quite a small proportion. The government could easily make that up. Uh, well, well, we shall see. <laughs> there's, there's plenty of time to debate this in the weeks <laughs> and months ahead, I fear. Donald Trump's arrival at the White House just three weeks ago it's called something of a political earthquake in Brussels, with the EU leaders going public about their concerns uh, about the new president's approach to trade, to defence, to human affairs, to international relations. In an open letter, the president of the European Council, that brings all the members together as heads of state, Donald Tusk wrote, Donald Trump's presidency and the change in Washington puts the European Union in a difficult situation with the new administration, seeming to put into question the last 70 years of American foreign policy. Chief Brexit negotiator, we saw him earlier, Guy Verhofstadt, told a think tank here in London, Chatham House, in January, that on a trip to Washington after Donald Trump's election, every European that I met in the US had only one conclusion, which is that the US has fewer friends, the EU, sorry, has fewer friends than ever in the USA today. And this week, the EU's trade commissioner, Cecilia Malmström, attacked Donald Trump's protectionist policies on trade and migration, saying, those who in the 21st century think that we can become great again by rebuilding borders, reimposing trade barriers, restricting people's freedom of movement, they are doomed to fail. So there we go. Well, the one thing that is clear is that for the first time uh, since this was an issue, the White House is run by someone who's basically hostile to the European mm. Union. Uh, and that's a total change from any previous administration. How should the EU handle this? Well, I think that it's very important that we try and get some kind of workable relationship, but not one where the EU, and obviously I'm going to talk about Britain as well, where we're in a kind of supplicant relationship. What I'm very worried about is the idea that we have to somehow support everything that Donald Trump is doing or not criticise it in order to have that relationship. You know, we're still going to have those commercial relationships at the same time as criticising him on human rights. You're still going to depend on America for your defence. 
Well, well, potentially, and I think actually this whole development could push more defence cooperation across the EU, could actually push the EU mm. to working more uh, together. Uh, Spending but, more money? Um, well, I mean, who knows, that's in the gift of the EU27 now. That's not something for Britain to be involved in. But we with, meet but our, our, quali our qualification. We meet our 2% mm. uh, on NATO. But, but the, the interesting point raised there, it could be if the 27 now regard the White House as something that is hostile to them, this could actually pull Europe together on a number of fronts. Mm -hmm. um, yes, well, I mean, uh, they, I, I think they should cease their hostility to Mr Trump and just accept the situation in the real world and talk to his ambassador rather than insulting him, Mr, Mr. Well, Mr. Malik. Well, we don't, he hasn't been appointed yet. Well, it's it's much that's, trailed. Uh, but it's going to be not... him or somebody like him. Oh, he's so. a fantasist. He makes well, up, you know, getting Well, let's not go down that, kind of that road. He's, <laughs> he's had enough of our time for the moment. I mean, if, if <laughs> the, I mean, I mean this, this point's been made, you're quite right, Andrew. Uh, this, this, if the EU actually wants to preserve itself in some form, then it should really look at what's gone wrong and, it's, and, and all these political things that we've been talking about that it does. It should get back to the idea of actually facilitating trade and cooperation. Then it could have some kind of a future, uh, like the uh, European Free Trade Association. That's what we were always told it was supposed to be. All right, let's, and let's... nobody would object to that kind of thing. Right, but it's difficult for you because the, the, the transatlantic trade deal is dead. That's over. Mm. It's dead in the water. Yes, uh, now, there's a huge argument over defence and of the right attitude to Russia. There will be increasing, and, and we've not even touched on uh, the White House's attitude to Germans' trade and uh, currency uh, policy. I mean, there's going to be rough times ahead. Yeah, there will be. And I think the way that we can face up to them is actually not by supplicating ourselves in front of Donald Trump. I mean, I, I'm very concerned. You talk about trade deals. We've had no assurance in the UK government that as part of our new deal between the UK and the US, our health services won't be opened up to US. Well, we haven't even started negotiating it yet. Um, well, and Mrs. May oh, said, Mrs May says she wants to start. No, no, she said that as far as she's concerned, the NHS is not for sale. But in any case, in the end of the day, that trade deal, if it does that, that's a matter for the parliament across the road to decide. Yes. The well, British people will decide that. Yeah, they, they will completely, but I think the British people are quite disturbed by having their leader appearing to fawn and, you know, supplicate herself in front of another foreign leader. If people decided that they wanted to have control when they voted to leave the European Union, I accept a lot right. of people did want that. Surely we don't want to leave the EU just suddenly to become controlled by the well, US. All right, we're going to leave it, we're going to move on because MEPs are gearing up for a vote next week on proposals for a new law governing non-military robots. I guess the military one's got to get out of jail card. So after a committee decided that great leaps in technology require regulation at an EU level. Here's our Adam again. He's been joined by his new friend, indeed his only friend, Sheldon. <laughs> Do you think we should have new legislation for robots? Why not? Why not? Yeah. And MEPs on the Justice Committee agree they've spent two years coming up with ideas for new legislation. Robots before were in industry and they were kept far away from, from uh, humans because they were so dangerous and now we assist a new generation. But it is also linked to the interconnectivity because robots, the new generation of robots are connected to, uh, to, to networks and they collect a lot of data so uh, they become more and more intelligent and how will we, will we interact with them and what will be the influence on our daily lives. Top of their list is sorting out who's responsible if a driverless car has a crash. They've also suggested that robots have the legal status of electronic people. Parliament was turned into a sort of low-budget edition of Robot Wars to get everyone ready for a vote next week. For all the new technology on display, there's plenty of old-fashioned human politics as well, because MEPs are split on a whole range of issues, whether there should be a new EU robotics agency, whether there should be a tax on robots for all the jobs that they replace, even whether robots are scary or not. If MEPs vote it through next Thursday, the report will be handed to the Commission, who will decide whether to proceed with legislation, which could take years, meaning one country is unlikely to be affected. What do you think about Brexit? <laughs> Brazil? No, not Brazil, Brexit. <laughs> Problem of communication, though. The French socialist candidate for president 
is suggesting we should tax robots. That would put them in their place, wouldn't it? Well, I, on a serious note, we do need to really think about what we're going to do to support people who might be made unemployed through many of these developments. I think it's quite interesting. In Finland, they've just brought in a mm. universal income that's partly to help people whose jobs are being mm. digitised. We need to think about these Tax things. robots? Try sending a tax bill to the Terminator. See where you get. <laughs> well, I'm going to leave that to you, because <laughs> I'm not going to try that myself. But I thank you both. <laughs> That's it for now. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.